Our economy is facing a unique challenge because we have three different factors coming together at the exact same time. On one end, we have high inflation, which is slowing down the economy. Second, we have the higher interest rates, which are also slowing down the economy. And then the Federal Reserve Bank in their most recent meeting minutes announced that they believe that we will enter a recession by the second half of this year. Now, I'm going to go over the Federal Reserve Bank's meeting minutes, especially when I talk about the economy in this video. Now, I've already gone through the Federal Reserve Bank's meeting minutes and read through it and analyzed it. But if you want to read it for yourself, which I highly encourage you to do, that way you can make your own assumptions because you never want to blindly trust or listen to a random guy on YouTube. I will also link those Federal Reserve Bank meeting minutes for you down in the description. But the reason why high inflation slows down the economy is because our economy runs on spending. The more money you spend, the more money somebody else makes. This is why your economic system is the way it is. Now, if you think about that, that means if you're broke and drowning in debt, it's not good for you, but it's good for the economic system because if you spend more money at Chipotle, if you spend more money at Gucci, and you had to go into debt to do that, that means you spent more money at these places and Chipotle and Gucci made more money. That's why high inflation hurts the economy because when the price of things have to rise and people's incomes don't rise fast enough to meet the high inflation, which is what we've been seeing happen, that means people have less spending ability because now more of your money is going to your rent, more of your money is going to your food, and you have less money to go out and travel, less money to go out and buy discretionary items, which means businesses get less sales. That's not good for the economy. So high inflation is slowing the economy. The second thing is the higher interest rates. Now, the higher interest rates are a little bit easier to understand because, for one, they influence spending. When mortgage rates go up, less people are interested in buying a home because that home is less affordable. If mortgage rates jumped up to 10% tomorrow, you bet that the demand to buy a home would fall, which would push home prices lower. If home prices, uh, sorry, if mortgage rates fell to 2% tomorrow, you bet that more people want to go out and buy a home, which would push home prices higher. So now we have higher interest rates today than we did six months ago. And when I talk about interest rates, I mean the interest rate that the Federal Reserve Bank sets. And these higher interest rates have an impact on the economy. The housing market is easy to understand, but it impacts every single aspect of the economy. The most notable example of this was just looking at what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. They collapsed because of higher interest rates. Silicon Valley Bank owned a lot of treasury loans, treasury bonds, loans to the government. And as interest rates went up, the value of these bonds went down, which meant the Silicon Valley Bank was sitting on a lot of underwater assets. And then you saw the bank run happen and they were not able to raise more money. And then they ultimately collapsed. So higher interest rates impact many different aspects of the economy, not just home buying, not just banks, but every aspect of the economy because higher interest rates make the cost of doing business more expensive and all three of these things then lead us to the economic slowdown which is why now the federal reserve bank is predicting a recession by the end of 2023 now again this is just semantics the average american is already in a recession but the federal reserve bank is now predicting that we will be in a defined actual recession by the end of 2023 and they gave a few reasons for this and let me start by talking about what the federal reserve bank had to say about the banking sector and how that is going to lead to a recession for the united states this is directly from the fed's meetings minutes they said given our assessment of the potential economic effects of the recent banking sector developments the staff's projection at the time of the March meeting included a mild recession starting later this year with a recovery over the subsequent two years. Meaning, because of what's happening in the banking sector, the Federal Reserve Bank is expecting that we will enter recession by the end of 2023 and then we're going to spend 2024 and 2025 then recovering from this recession. And what is the cause of this recession according to the Federal Reserve Bank? Well, the first domino, which is the banking crisis. And the reason why the banking crisis, according to the Fed, is going to cause this type of recession, this economic pain, is because of the credit crunch caused by the banking collapse. Now, again, we did a full deep dive of this in Market Briefs, my free financial newsletter. If you have not joined Market Briefs yet, I highly recommend you do so because it's free and it's an easy way for you to stay up to date on what's happening in the financial markets. And I got the link to how you can join Market Briefs down in the description below. But this is right now the reason why the banking crisis is causing a credit crunch is because, well, less banks are likely to lend because of what's happening. Banks have to become 
more cautious. They have to become more safe. And when they're becoming more cautious and more safe, they're lending less money. The reason why that's important is because, again, our economic system runs on spending. And so if banks are lending less money, that means you have less money to go out and buy things with. Now, this could be you wanting to buy a home. It could be you wanting to buy a car. Or it could be you as a business who wants to invest in more manufacturing. Or you as a business who wants to open a new plant or a new headquarters or wants to expand your operations. And so when less lending is happening, less, less money is entering our economic system, which means less spending is happening. And if less spending is happening, well... You get it. That will slow down the economy. This is why the Federal Reserve Bank is now stating that they predict that we will enter a recession by the end of 2023. The second thing that the Federal Reserve Bank talked about when it came to this slowdown in the economy had to do with our economic growth and inflation. Let me read you what they said. They said, with inflation rem remaining unacceptably high, participants expected that a period of below trend growth in real GDP would be needed to bring aggregate demand into better balance with aggregate supply and thereby reducing inflationary pressures. What that means is right now we still have the stubbornly high inflation. Yes, inflation has come off, off of its high, but it's still extremely high. And this is where the Federal Reserve Bank is working to raise interest rates to bring inflation down. But in order to bring inflation down, they need to cool down demand. How do they cool down demand? By raising interest rates. Why does that cool down demand? Because higher interest rates make it more expensive for you to buy things. That will then make spending slower because less people buy homes, less people buy cars, less businesses go out and invest because the cost of borrowing is higher, which would then lead to lower spending, which would then lead to a slowdown in the GDP, our economy. And this is where the Federal Reserve Bank is saying that a below trend growth in real GDP would be needed, that it is needed to slow down the growth of our economy in order to cool down inflation. And it's interesting because on one hand, the high inflation is already hurting our economic growth. Why is the high inflation hurting our economic growth? Because again, when you have this high inflation, people don't have the ability to go out and buy things the way that they could before. So high inflation is hurting the economic growth. And this is where now the Fed is saying that we need to slow down our economic growth even more. That way we can cool down the inflation. How do they do that? By raising interest rates. And this is where the Federal Reserve Bank is saying that there is going to be impacts of this. And we still have to continue raising interest rates. This was a big question mark after the Silicon Valley bank crisis, because when that bank crisis happened, a lot of people were unsure on what was going to happen. First, it was that FDIC insurance would only protect you up to $250,000. But then we saw Janet Yellen and the FDIC and the Federal Reserve Bank come together. And they essentially said that we will insure your deposits up to infinity. Now, there's still a lot of uncertainty about what that actually means and what that will look like if we have more bank failures in the future. And a lot of people do believe that we will see more bank failures. Even Warren Buffett recently come out and said that we will see more bank failures. But it looks like there's at least some sort of commitment by the FDIC to continue to protect depositors, meaning people who save their money in a bank. And after this all happened, there was a lot of uncertainty. And even the Federal Reserve Bank talked about this, where they were unsure whether they should continue raising interest rates aggressively or even at all because of the bank failures. Here's what the Fed had to say. Some participants noted that given persistently high inflation and the strength of the recent economic data, they would have considered a 50 basis point increase in the interest rate. But because of what's going on in the banking sector, that has caused the Federal Reserve Bank to not do that. In other words, the Federal Reserve Bank said that they were thinking about raising interest rates by 0.5% because of how strong inflation was. But then because of what happened in the banking sector, they decided to do it by 0.25%. And you can bet that they were debating about whether they should even increase interest rates at all. And so this is where now you start putting it all together. We have some issues in the banking sector, but now we've kind of had this band-aid put on top of it. The government and the FDIC have come together and they said, we're going to put this Band-Aid on the banking sector so it doesn't continue bleeding because we're going to insure the depositors. Now, of course, there's a cost to insuring depositors and that cost will be either if FDIC has to pay out more money, that is inflation because FDIC doesn't have enough money to insure all depositors. 
and the FDIC is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. So if you see more banking failures and FDIC has to pay out bigger deposits, that will be paid by the government. But then you also have the government saying that the additional deposits would be paid out by private banks, by fees to the banks. Well, how do private banks get their money? They get their money by charging you and me and regular people service fees, which means that if banks have to pay higher costs, then that's ultimately going to be trickled down to you. So there's a cost to everything, but you know, I think we've pretty much established that, that no matter what happens, there's going to be a cost to it. Now, when it comes back to the idea of the slowing economy, this is where now understanding what's happening. We are still in a place where, yeah, unemployment is very strong. Like Unemployment is very low. We have a lot of people that have jobs, although they might not have the jobs that they want or they might not feel like they're getting paid enough. The reality is people still have jobs. But one of the factors that the Federal Reserve Bank is working on or what they say is going to be a byproduct of this reducing demand, the slowdown in GDP, is going to be higher unemployment. Right now, our unemployment is right around 3.5%. And they're expecting unemployment to go up to 4.5%. By the end of 2023, which means if you just do the math, that's about 2 million Americans who would have to lose their job between now and the end of the year in order to bring us to the unemployment level where the Federal Reserve Bank thinks that we're going to be. Now, you can either think that the Federal Reserve Bank is being very conservative or they're being very aggressive. But just remember, the Federal Reserve Bank doesn't want to panic people. They historically have said the most optimistic views because if the Federal Reserve Bank is saying, more negative views that people would panic and that would cause more havoc. That's why the Federal Reserve Bank kept saying, we're not going to see any inflation. What are you talking about? How could we see high inflation from printing trillions of dollars? Then they said that the inflation was transitory. Then they said, don't worry, we got it under control. And then when inflation hit 9%, they said that we have to get aggressive to bring inflation down. So right now we have the Federal Reserve Bank who is saying that inflation, or sorry, unemployment is going to go up to around 4.5% and that they expect about 2 million Americans to lose their jobs to get the unemployment number there. Why do they want to see the softening in the labor market? Well, it's not that they want to see people lose their jobs, it's that they want to see inflation come down. And one of the byproducts of raising interest rates to bring inflation down is that you see this cooling in the economy, aka businesses have to reduce, and that means that people have to lose their jobs. Now, if it's worse than that, then that means even more people would lose their jobs, more businesses go under, and now, this is where I want you to understand. This is what the Federal Reserve Bank is saying. What can you do about it? Number one is get the emotion out of the equation. You have a lot of people here and on the internet, and I understand YouTube is a big play in this. There's a lot of emotion in the financial markets. And the reality is in the media game on the internet, if you don't have, let's just say, an attractive title, nobody clicks on it. Okay, I understand that. And that's why we have to use some of the titles that we use. But do not follow a title. Now, one of the things that I try to do is provide education in the videos. That way you can get a better understanding of what's happening instead of just being led down an emotional roller coaster of what might be happening in the financial markets. But this is where, I mean, that's also why I created market briefs because you don't have to worry about the sensationalism. You get one email and the email breaks down everything you need to know. That way we don't have to go into that whole clickbaity game. That's why I'm so trying to grow market briefs instead of trying to give the education through this traditional media game. But back to the focus of this video, there is a lot of craziness out there. There's a lot of emotion out there. And what I want you to understand now as a financially savvy person is that some people will get hurt because of this economic slowdown. And what I want you to do is not be one of those people who gets hurt. Instead, I want you to be one of the people that understands this and can actually capitalize on the opportunities. And the way that you can do that is by number one, getting the emotion out and rather cut through the noise and read the actual data, read the actual information, and then look for opportunities. The way you look for opportunities is by number one, understanding where the opportunities might be. And these are not by going out and buying things, but rather by buying investments. Here's the reality. Recessions and market crashes create more millionaires than any other time. Why? Because recessions and market crashes cause the price of good assets to go on sale. 
Why? Because when you see market crashes and recessions, people panic and they sell. Why? Because when you see recessions and market crashes, you see bad assets fail. Why? Because when you see recessions and market crashes, people don't have the ability to spend, and that's when the tide goes out. People don't have the same access to money, and the dumb and bad businesses fail. That's why the saying is, when the tide goes out, you see who's been swimming naked. When the party ends and the lights turn on, you see who's been partying a little bit too hard. And so now, when the money starts to fade away, and you start to see the bad investments get exposed, people will get worried. Either people will get worried about what's going on with their investments. It might be a good investment or bad investment, which could cause people to sell. People might panic and they might sell. Or people will need money and they will sell. This is what has happened for decades. This is not me predicting what could happen in the future. This is me telling you what has happened decade after decade after decade after decade. It's the same thing. That's why I always say history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So that is what has happened in the past. And so now, if you can find an opportunity, whether it's in a stock, whether it is in a real estate opportunity, whether it is starting a business, whether it's investing in a business idea, whether it's an alternative investment, if you can find an opportunity, well now, if you are prepared, you can go ahead and actually take advantage of the opportunity. Now, how do you get prepared? Number one is by investing in your financial education. Clearly, you are doing that by watching this video. But reading books, watching videos, potentially investing money into learning more, that is investing in your financial education so you can learn how to do things like analyzing a stock, analyzing a real estate investment, making a real estate investment, going out and starting a business, or investing in startup companies. You can learn how to do that by paying money, reading books, or by watching YouTube videos. Then the next way that you're prepared is by putting aside cash. Because the reality is when these opportunities come, you have to have money to be able to take advantage of these opportunities. And if you're worried about how you're going to pay your bills because you lost your job or because something's going on in the economy, you can't take advantage of opportunities because you're worried about how you're going to put food on the table. And so preparing also means now being financially smart when times are okay. 2023 is not the year to go out and finance a new truck, period. 2023 is the year for you to now start building your financial savviness, putting some cash aside to protect you against an emergency, putting cash aside to take advantage of opportunities that might come your way, and putting money aside to start investing and learning about investing because there's a lot of different investing strategies. You can be a passive investor, which I do. You can also be an active investor, which I also do. Passive investing is where you don't worry about what's happening in the market or the economy. You just keep putting your money into this asset, into this thing, no matter what happens. So I personally, and I'm not telling you what to do, investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money, which is why you should always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. I'm just telling you what I do to tell you what I do. I passively invest my money in three places. I passively invest my money into the stock market. I passively invest my money to buy physical gold, and I passively invest my money to buy some cryptocurrency. Now, in the stock market, I have a system where every Wednesday, money leaves my checkings account and is automatically invested into my portfolio of ETFs. These are funds that give me exposure to a basket of companies. Some of these are value ETFs. Some of these are dividend-paying ETFs. In fact, most of these are dividend-paying ETFs. Some of these are emerging markets. These are countries and companies that are overseas. Some of these are more of my, the innovation and risk asset type of ETFs. So every Wednesday, it does not matter whether the market's up or down, my system keeps pulling cash out and it keeps investing into these things and it happens no matter what. If you see a market crash, you don't change it. The only change that I would make is potentially buy more. When the market's booming, you don't change it. It's this passive, consistent, and automatic. With cryptocurrency, it's similar, except now it's daily. I believe in the long-term value of crypto, but I also understand that it's extremely volatile. I understand that it's extremely speculative. I understand that it can go down to zero. But I have a system where I'm buying some cryptocurrencies, some of the bigger coins, every day. And it's not a ton of money. It's a very small piece of my portfolio. But I accumulate that because I believe that cryptocurrency and the blockchain will have more value in the future. 
Now, can it go down to zero? Sure. If it did, would I be affected? Not really. There's a small piece of my portfolio and I understand that. The third thing is I buy physical gold. Now, again, I buy physical gold passively and I buy it every month. And I'm not talking about buying gold ETFs or gold paper certificates. I'm buying the actual physical gold. There are platforms on the internet that can do that for you and that can automate the process. That's just what I do. Now, again, do not copy what I do. I do not recommend what I do to anybody because you have a different time horizon. You have a different risk tolerance. You have a different goal than I do. And you have a different investment criteria. I like cash flow. Most of my investments are cash flow producing. You might hate cash flow. Some people don't like investing for cash flow because you got to pay taxes on the cash flow. I like cash flow. So don't do what I do, but rather learn. And this is where now, what is your investment criteria? What's your investment portfolio and how do you learn how to invest? These are my passive investments. I also have active investments. Number one, I actively invest back into my own business. I talked about briefs media. Market Briefs is one of the newsletters that we have in Briefs Media, and I'm actively working to help grow that newsletter. The second place where I actively invest my money is into real estate. Outside of my own business, real estate is probably my favorite place to invest money because I like owning a hard asset, and again, it creates cash flow. Third, I actively invest into stocks, individual companies. I passively invest into the funds, but if I find an individual company that I want to invest in and that I find is a good opportunity, I will then go out and buy then I also have active investments into startups. I recently started doing this in the last few years around the time when the pandemic started. And I like it because I've been very fortunate to build up a platform here where I can also help promote and grow companies that I, I believe in or that I'm a part of. And then secondly, because I like working with entrepreneurs. I am an entrepreneur myself. And so it's kind of cool and fun for me to be able to invest in and help other entrepreneurs but it's risky. The statistics say that something like eight or nine out of 10 startups will fail within the first five years. Meaning statistically, most of the companies, almost every single one of the companies I invest in will fail, go down to zero. And startup investing is a little bit more interesting because you can't get your cash out the way you can with a stock or a real estate investment because you can just sell those. With a startup, you're kind of just waiting to see if the startup will get acquired or if it will go public. And if neither of those two things happen, you will never see your money again. Now there's platforms on the internet which make this type of startup investing so much more accessible. These are called crowdfunded investments, but it's a small piece of my investment portfolio. It's something that I enjoy. It's something that I believe in, which is why I invest my money there. So now based off of that, again, I don't recommend what I do to anybody, but you can now do your own research and find the right opportunity for you. What are the ways that you want to invest? Do you want to be a passive investor? Do you want to be an active investor? Do you want to do both? The big thing is, is you got to just do something. Yes, you will lose money at some point. Losing money is a part of the process, but you got to just get started. And for me, I started off as an active investor. I liked investing. It's something that's enjoyable to me. I like finance. I know I'm a nerd, but these are things that I enjoy. If you enjoy it, then maybe you can start off as an active investor. If you don't want to spend the time and effort and energy and research doing that, then you can be a passive investor. But the key is you just got to get started because now the reality is we have all these red flags in the economy. Now, you can either sit there and do nothing or you can prepare. And the nice thing is if you prepare and nothing bad happens, well, you're just in a better financial situation than you were before. You have extra cash put aside. But if you prepare and something bad happens, now, not only can you be protected, but you can take advantage of opportunities to come your way. And this is where so many people end up getting hurt because the reality is every decade or so, we go through some sort of economic slowdown or market crash. We saw it happen in 2020. We saw it happen in 2008. We saw it happen in the year 2000 with the dot-com bubble bursting. And do you know what's interesting? After the 2008 crash, do you want to know the longest period in the history of modern America, the longest period that our economy has ever gone without a recession? Well, it was after the 2008 crash. And that was almost a forced recession because when the pandemic hit, our economy was shut down. So obviously we're going to recession because nobody's making money, nobody's doing anything. But if it wasn't for, I mean, even with that, that was the longest period from the 2020, 2008 bottom to the 2020 pandemic, that was the longest period that our country has ever gone without an economic slowdown. 
So now, when you understand that, you understand the history rhymes, you understand that, hey, we have some red flags in the economy, we have interest rates that are rising, we have inflation that is still high, now the Federal Reserve Bank is saying that we are expecting a recession by the end of 2023, what can you do about it? You can ignore it and say, oh, everything is fine. You can panic and say, oh my God, why has it not happened right now? Or you can start preparing, because the reality is nobody can perfectly predict or time the market. While the Fed says this is going to happen by the end of 2023, it might not. But we still have the red flags. And it might take longer than expected. Or it might be shorter than expected. I mean, there's still a lot of money out there. JP Morgan's latest statement in their annual report said that there's like $1.2 trillion of excess money since the beginning of the pandemic still floating around out there in people's bank accounts. So... Maybe it will take longer than expected. Maybe it won't. Maybe it won't ever happen. Maybe it will. But the reality is we have these red flags out there. And this is what you want to be paying attention to. That way you can prepare and take care of yourself. We are in the calm before the recession storm. At least that's according to Jamie Dimon, who is the CEO at J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. Every year, J.P. Morgan puts out their own annual statement where they talk about their opinions of what's going on in the economy, their worries about the economy, what they think is coming in the economy, and then Jamie Dimon also